Hello, everybody. Welcome to part 10 of our study of the return of the Divine Sophia. I've actually, this is actually the third time that I am recording this part for you guys. The first two parts, my camera and vocals completely shut down, and I didn't know that until I went back to edit the footage. Interestingly enough, in this section, chapter, which we're going to be covering in part 10, is chapter 13, which covers Jesus and the lost gospels. Now, I personally do not believe in coincidences. And if you guys have been following me for a long time on this channel, you know that I kind of made a name for myself um, by going through the missing gospels here in the quote unquote truther community. Um, and so it's quite interesting that I'm now having to record this section for a third time. And we know that the the war that's going on between good and evil right now is very, very, very strong. We know that the church is part of the evil. If you haven't figured that out by now, sorry to tell you, but they're part of the problem. And we know that the church is not teaching the real teachings of Yahshua because the real teachings of Yahshua are found in the missing books of the Bible, not the canonized books of the Bible. There are allegedly supposed to be 777 books in our biblical canon. We only have 66 of those. And of those 66 books, they are copyrighted by the Windsor family. If this is the word of God, then there shouldn't be a copyright on it. So we know, we know that there's been a lot of corruption a lot of changing in the books of the Bible. We know that the real story of Yahshua is not the one that they present in the New Testament. They took the teachings of Yahshua and they merged it with the story of Mithra. And if that's something that's new to you, then I would recommend that you look up Mithraism and you start to do your own research so that you can start to deprogram yourself um, from the programming of the church. We know that the word church comes from the Scottish word kirk, which comes from the Greek goddess Circe. She was a goddess who was known to hypnotize people and then feed off of them. That's why it's called a church and not a temple. They're telling you what they're doing to you. And so it's not lost on me that the first two times I filmed this, the footage got screwed up. We know that the powers that be on the dark side use heavy 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 witchcraft heavy 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 dark magic i know that they're able to jump into my um machinery and watch i know this and so i'm doing this again for a third time if you're watching this on youtube then it obviously worked the third time was the charm but if it doesn't work to the controllers watching me right now i'll keep going i'll just read this on a live this is important information. And so with that being said, I am once again going to ask for Michael and Gabriel and all of the beings of light that are here for humanity's highest good to be here in this moment to protect me, to use my words as a vessel to help other people. I ask that you will protect the footage and you will keep any beings human or otherwise out of this recording block them i do not consent for them being here i ask that or i command that any of my wounds any of my weaknesses or any of the viewers wounds or, or weaknesses if they consent to not be used as a loophole of interest for any dark entities that are trying to screw this up you do not have my consent I do not give you permission. You cannot be here. And I ask that Michael and Gabriel, please help keep that consent, that non-consent rather intact. All right, with that being said, we're gonna be starting again for the third time for me with chapter 13, Jesus and the Lost Gospels. Now, the, the good thing about this book um, versus the other books we've done is you don't necessarily, the way that she's done this book is you don't necessarily have to be following along in the order. So if this is your first time here, welcome. I'm very happy you're here. You can continue listening 
if you want to, you don't need to go back and listen to parts one through nine to understand what we're going to be talking about. However, if you do want to go back and listen to parts one through nine, I am going to be putting the playlist down in the description box below. It's called Understanding the Magdalene. We are going through this book. We've already gone through the Sophia Code. We've already gone through the Magdalene Manuscript. And we're also going through the Hathor material in this playlist too. Now, speaking of that, before we get into this, I almost forgot. So Shanti from Aquarius Rising Africa had mentioned to me perhaps doing the Sophia Code again on their channel. And if that's something you guys are interested in, let me know because I would—I told her absolutely, I would be more than happy to do the Sophia Code again with you guys um, if that's something you guys are, are up for. So um, yeah, let me know down in the comment section below if that's something you guys would be interested in. All right, here we go for a third time. Chapter 13, Jesus and the Lost Gospels. Let him who seeks not seek from seeking until he finds. And when he finds, he will be turned around. And when he is turned around, he will marvel, and he shall reign over all. The Gospel of Thomas, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And if you've been on this channel for a while now, you know that the Gospel of Thomas was the very first lost book of the Bible that we covered on this channel. All of those lost and missing books of the Bible can be found in the Dark Outpost playlist on my channel. I will also put that in the description box below. Of all this discussion about polarities within religions made me want to take a deeper look at what happened in Christianity. I knew that Jesus' essential message was one of unity, love, forgiveness, and non-judgment. So how had things become so messed up in our thinking? In the name of the Prince of Peace, the church had killed millions during the centuries of Inquisition. However, to truly understand how his teachings had been twisted and lost, I realized that I would have to start with a new study of the New Testament. And that is true. Out of all the religions in the world, the Christian faith has more blood on its hand than anything. It has more blood on its hand than Satanism. There's a problem there. Like many people, I had always been drawn to the beauty and mastery of Christ's teachings. But I wondered why so little of Jesus' wisdom had been written down. I pondered at the nearly three decades of his absence in the Bible before his ministry began and why no one else seemed to question where Jesus had been during all those decades before he started his ministry in Jerusalem. If you've been on this channel for a while, then you know where he was because it's covered in the missing books of the Bible. His whole life is covered in those books. I think the uh, Christians are going to be very upset to find that he was in India studying yoga with a master teacher in India. I speculated that the real reason so many things about Jesus' life were concealed was because the early church fathers hadn't want us to know that he had been initiated in other spiritual traditions. Yes, so what I thought if there had been other spiritual masters of wisdom in the world. It is clear to anyone who studies the great world religion that the sages appear periodically throughout history. The concept of a great world savior who arrives to bring illumination is nothing new. Even the story of how that being is resurrected was intrinsic to the mystery traditions of the ancients, like Osiris, the Egyptian Lord of Light, who was killed by his jealous half-brother Set when resurrected by the power of Isis's love. The themes of Jesus' life resonate through time. These archetypal elements of selfless service, death, and resurrection can also be found in the stories of Mithra, quasi Krishna, and Dionysus. Manly P. Hall, a 33rd degree mason and author of The Teaching of All Sages writes, and before we get into his teachings, I have said this countless times and I will keep saying it until we understand this. The darkness cannot create anything the darkness cannot create anything all the darkness can do is steal from the light and invert it or mimic the light and invert it but the darkness cannot create anything so if you're still still one of those truthers that thinks osiris and isis are bad or that the eye of Horus is bad, or that the pyramids are bad, then I hate to tell you, you are still very much asleep. You have not awoken yet. The darkness cannot create anything. Only the light 
can create. And so everything that the darkness uses, that the controllers use, that the dark cult uses, was first and foremost created by the light for the highest good of humanity. It was then stolen by the darkness and inverted. So that means it is our job to take back what was ours and put it back to its original template. If we went vigilante and got rid of everything the controllers had inverted, we would literally have nothing left. And it was ours to begin with. We're taking it back. And so when we start to read in writings of Freemasons, this is stuff we should be studying because they stole the information from us. So before anybody goes crazy in the comment sections, this is important. This is very, very important because the Freemasons stole the information from the good. And so for us to understand that knowledge, we need to see what they know. And so I'm happy that she's quoting a Freemason here because we need to see this. All right. So he goes on to say, the list of deathless mortals who suffered for a man that he might receive the boom of eternal life is an imposing one. Among those connected historically or allegorically, allegorically with crucifixion are Prometheus, Adonis, Apollo, Adius, Bacchus, Buddha, Krishna, Horus, Indra, Ixion, Mithra, Osiris, Pythagoras, Quasicotal, Semiramis, and Jupiter. According to the Phragmatic account's extent, all these heroes gave their lives to the service of humanity and with one or two exceptions died as martyrs for the cause of human progress. Is it possible that most of them were crucified upon a cross or a tree? So why would honoring the lives of other spiritual masters be so terrible, I wondered? If anything, their stories underscore the importance of Jesus' life, making his message even more eternal. To me, it was deeply reassuring to know that some aspect of the divine returns to the world again and again to teach human beings how to connect with the spiritual light within. In the ancient world, this light bearer was called the Aeon, the messenger who arrives at the beginning of the world age or Eon to deliver the spiritual message that will get us through the next 2160 year cycle. But apparently the church fathers disagree. So they sought to conceal the true history of Jesus's life and the depth of his teachings. Deeper questions and inner teachings. In time, these questions prompted me to write a book about the lost years of Jesus and his connection to the spiritual mysteries of the past. These great mystery schools of initiation had once been established in many countries and regions, including Egypt, Greece, England, India, Persia, and even Galilee under the Essenes. Yes, because the Essenes were Egyptians. The Essenes, E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, is how you would spell the name Isis back in that time. We know from our studies that Jesus or Yahshua, which was his real name, and Magdalene, his wife, were not Jewish. They were not born Jewish. That's a fact. They had Jewish students, but they were they themselves were not Jewish. They were Egyptian. They were born into the priest and priesthood of Isis, hence why they were the a scenes. This, of course, is also, if you've been on this channel for a while, where we get the name Tennessee, which means the country of Isis. There are Isis temples in Tennessee, which goes back to Tartaria. If you're studying along with Tartaria, we know the true history, not the history that the controllers teach us, but the true history is that the real Egypt was here in the Americas, not over where we think Egypt is. True Israel was here in the Americas. And so that is why we have states like Tennessee, because they have to tell us, as we know, they have to tell us the truth somehow. And if we don't stand up and say, no, 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 this isn't right, then we're giving our consent. And so they're telling us the truth by giving us states names like Tennessee. They're telling us that this was actually where Egypt was. We're just 
too lazy to, to research and know what it is they're actually telling us until now. Now, we, now we're waking up. Now we're researching. But in my early years of self-discovery, I did not realize their incredible importance, nor did I know that these schools have been in existence for some 4,000 years before Jesus was born and for some 400 years after the crucifixion. And if, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. You guys know if you've been with me for a while, I don't believe he was actually crucified. That's a story for a different day. We're reading her research, though. But my opinion is that Yahshua was not crucified. Nor did I comprehend how the suppression of these wisdom, wisdom teachings by the church was directly responsible for the great imbalance we see in the world today. These mystery schools had once taught a balanced approach of yin and yang between men and women creating role models for people to aspire to their own inherited divinity without ego or shame. Yet so affected was the church's annihilation of this early wisdom literature that today most people are not even aware that such schools existed. While it is clear that the Orthodox Church borrowed many customs from these religions, including the practice of baptism, the Eucharist rites, and the use of parables and teachings, and initially adopted the same three-tiered uh, structure of initiation, today most of us know nothing about them. However, because Jesus was an initiate of these paths, the word mysteria or mystery is used some 28 times in the New Testament in connection with his teachings. But when I began to study with Shasta, I knew none of this. At that time, I could not explain while the dualistic paths of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity had fostered philosophies of violence, judgment, and separation in the world. But in my short time with Shasta, I had realized that much of what I knew about traditional history might be wrong. If I was ever to get to the bottom of his conundrum, I would have to discover the hidden history of what had come before. While I suspected that Jesus' real teachings held powerful keys to these mysteries, the underlying question was this. Where were these teachings today and how could I study them? What had Jesus actually taught that was no longer in the Bible? And why had only Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John written Gospels? Years later, I was to learn that many of the other disciples had also recorded his words, but that the early church fathers had ordered the destruction of these documents. Today, most Christians do not realize that less than 10% of Jesus' life is covered in the Bible or that there are more than 500 Gospels siphoned through by the Roman Orthodoxy in order to select 27 books in the New Testament. Nor do we realize that 13 of these 27 books were written by Paul, a man who did not even know Jesus, but whose thoughts profoundly shaped Roman Catholicism. Nor do we realize that the process of selection of the Orthodox Gospels was hotly debated for over three centuries by scores of individuals with their own personal or political agendas, or that even after these Gospels were officially selected, a team of correctors were hired to edit, to edit these teachings for political purposes of the church. The church is Mark Zuckerberg. Wake up. The church is Dr. F. The church is the Mr. B administration. These people were the original fact checkers. So how deeply brainwashed do you have to be to know that the schools, the medicine, the government, that all these things have been corrupted, but the church is still pure? Give me a break. The church was one of the first to be corrupted, guys. Christianity today ain't nothing but Satanism with a bow on it. Let me reread this again for those in the back who still are not understanding this. Nor do we realize that the process of selection of the Orthodox Gospels was hotly debated over three centuries by scores of individuals with their own personal or political agendas, or that even after these Gospels were selected, a team of correctors were hired to edit these teachings for the political purposes of the church. Nothing screams deep state 
quite as loud as the church does. It is also important to remember that the Old and New Testaments were written by men. Certainly some of this writing is divinely inspired, but these were flawed human beings. Jew Jews, Greek, Roman, and Catholic men who were doing the best they could to understand the events that had shaped their inherited histories. And as we have seen in the Old Testament accounts, the Bible is a hodgepodge collection of writings amassed over time. The New Testament is composed of writings from over 60 individuals across four centuries. And many of these books were transcribed multiple times from earlier accounts. As anyone who has ever played the game of Whisper knows, time and repetition can change our perception of a phrase with only a word or two. Thus, the official correctors who removed entire tracts of text to fit the dictates of the newly forming church had shared only a portion, only a portion of the true teachings of Yahshua ben Yosef, who is better known to the world by Jesus. And I'm going to say it again. If you never questioned why they changed his name from Yeshua to Jesus, that's where you should start. That is where you, why did they change his name? I know why. A lot of people on this channel know why. Why did they change his name? A treasure trove. Catholic priest Jean-Yves Lapou, translator of the Gospel of Philip, another gospel we've covered on this channel, the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, writes that the traditional gospels were put into effective use in building church institutions that staked a claim, so to speak, to the entire territory of Christianity, fitting in a land which was originally open and free. Lapou is the pen name of Pierre Jean Serafin, a priest affiliated with the French Orthodox Monastery of Saint Michael de Var in Provence, France. A brilliant scholar, theologian, and speaker, Lapou is also a devout Christian. They discard ancient writings are now these discarded ancient writings are now called apocryphal, a word derived from the Greek meaning hidden or secret. Apo means under referring to that which is beneath the scriptures. So these are the secret t teachings that underlie Christianity, but were concealed by the orthodoxy. Over the past two decades, some of these apocryphal writings have begun to make their way into public spheres, creating a stir among those who long to know more about Jesus' life. While some might wish to dismiss these gospels out, out of hand, it would not be wise to do so. Not only are most of them dated earlier than the four Gospels found in the New Testament, but they were preserved by the first Gnostic communities of Christians, indicating that they are closer to the original teachings of Yahshua than the Gospels in the New Testament. They have not had centuries of mistranslation overlaid on them, nor have they been subject to manipulation in councils. Today, these texts are helping scholars to reframe early Christian history, for they contain many powerful keys to understanding the deeper mission of Jesus. Lapu reminds us, there are those who are disturbed by the intermittency and the origins of Christianity. Yet the coming to light of these ancient apocryphal writings should, on the contrary, remind us of the richness and freedom of those origins. If becoming a truly adult human being means taking responsibility for the unconsciousness that presides over most of our conscious actions, then perhaps now is the time for Christianity to become truly adult. Grow the fuck up, Christianity. That's what he's saying. Grow up. You're corrupt. Grow up. It now has the opportunity to become these gospels, thereby welcoming into the consciousness that which has been repressed by our culture. Our culture now has a chance to integrate alongside its historical, rational, and more or less masculine values, those other dimensions that are more mystical, imaginary, and in a word, feminine. It is now known that for the first few centuries after Christ, there were many groups who interpreted Jesus' words in their own way. Just as there are some 30,000 Christian sects who each have their own distinct understanding of Christ's words today. 
Catholic theologian Leonard Brown writes that scholars suddenly become aware in the 19th century that the church had not existed as a unified body in the first few centuries after Jesus' death, but was actually composed of several distinct groups, each associated with different foundational figures such as Peter, Paul, Mark, and Magdalene. Many of these groups had vastly different interpretations of Jesus' teaching. Yes, they ran schools. They were schools. They were not dogmatic churches. They were schools, a bit like yoga schools or ashrams are today. Yet in 367 CE, the very powerful Archbishop Anthanius of Alexandria, I hope I'm saying that right, sent an order to purge all the apocryphal books claiming they, these to be the words of heretics and becoming the victor in a political war of silence and repression that resulted in the deaths of millions. Sounds like the cabal still doing its same old tricks now as it was then. For centuries, the only thing that biblical scholars knew about such heretical scriptures was written by the very man who suppressed them. Propaganda. Elaine Pagel, a professor of religious studies at, Pri at Princeton, writes, Those who wrote and circulated these texts did not regard themselves as heretics. We can see throughout the history of Christianity how varying beliefs about the nature of God inevitably bear different political implications. Martin Luther, more than 1,300 years later, felt impelled by his own religious experience and transformed the understanding of God to challenge the practices endorsed by his superiors, and finally, to reject its entire papal and priestly system. Pagel goes on to tell us someone, possibly a monk, from the nearby monastery at St. Pachimus, near where the Nag Hammadi texts were found, probably took the banned books and hid them from the destruction in a jar where they remained buried for almost 1600 years. And I really like Pagel, Elaine Pagel. She's amazing. Really like her work. So let us now take a look at the famous lost gospels, which open the door to deeper understandings of Jesus's teaching about the nature of God's connection to humanity. The Nag Hammadi text, the Nag Hammadi library, as some have as it has come to be called, was actually discovered by an Arabian peasant in the mountains surrounding the Egyptian village of Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt, northwest of modern-day Luxor. The books and other texts in this library were discovered in 1945, just two years before the Dead Sea Scrolls were unearthed in 1947. Hidden in large earthware jar, these 13 leather-bound books and 55 different texts include many Gospels never before seen by biblical scholars, yet referenced in the early literature of the Church. In 1980 CE, Bishop Arrhenius denounced some of them by name, calling them blasphemous and heretical. Scholars tell us these codex were buried together, hidden within a large sealed jar at the time of the, the Theodosian decrees around 390 CE, decrees that ordered the destruction of all reference materials not chosen by the Orthodox Roman Church. Some believe these texts may be the oldest examples ever discovered of leather-bound books, and they have all been dated somewhere between 60 and 400 CE, meaning that many of these books were created in the years just after the crucifixion. Today, these texts are called codex because they have individual parchment sheets inside and appear to be accounts from the disciples who actually studied with Jesus. They include the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Thomas, the Dialogue of the Savior, the Secret Book of John, the Secret Book of James, the Gospel of Truth, the Gospel of the Egyptians, the Apocalypse of Paul, the Apocalypse of Peter, and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, just to name a few. While some of these texts confirm our existing Gospels, others reveal philosophies directly at odds with the Orthodox Christianity, a doctrine we have been conditioned, conditioned, programmed, mind-controlled to believe for nearly 2,000 years. These newly discovered landmark writings focus on Jesus' teachings on several pivotal subjects, karma, reincarnation, the existence of the Divine Mother, the multi-dimensional nature of the universe and the existence of gods, eons, and demiurgs, or the false god that rules this world, as well as the descent of the soul into the world of matter. Yes, guys, in all the missing books of the Bible about Yahshua talks openly about reincarnation and karma being your work. He also talks about how the god of this world is Lucifer. Not source creator, it's Lucifer. Makes sense, doesn't it? The God that I serve is not the God of this world. Not yet, anyway. Why do you think the churches want you to call God Yahweh? Yahweh means Moloch.
once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you hear it, you can't unhear it. The truth is right there. It's right in front of you. Jesus also tells us that we have the power to connect with God directly, reminding us that the divine lies within us and can be accessed directly. Yet the Orthodox Church kept this information hidden, ordering the destruction of all non-canonical texts under the penalty of death. The one thing that censorship has really taught me through this experience is they censor what they fear, which is the truth. Ask your pastor, why does the church censor these missing books of the Bible? And if he says it's because they're heretical, ask him why. What's the proof that they're heretical? Ask your pastor again, why does the Bible have a copyright on it? You know who owns the Bible? The Windsors. You can look that up. The Windsors own the copyright to the Bible. All the other religious texts of other religious religions in the world are public domain. But the Bible has a copyright on it. Why would the supposed word of God have a copyright on it? Shit's not adding up, is it? The Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 11 caves near the Essene community of Qumran between 1947 and 1956. They consist of some 800 to 850 texts, mainly written on tiny scraps of parchment. Carbon dating has placed these scrolls between 120 BCE and 50 CE, which means some of these writings predate the birth of Jesus by over 100 years. Since we know that the first Christian community in the world was established in Britain in 37 CE by Joseph of, Joseph of Arimathea, these writings would be extremely close to the actual events. They are written in Hebrew and Aramaic, both languages that Jesus and his followers spoke. Before their discovery, the earliest known gospels that we possessed had already been translated into Greek from Aramaic. Greek was the mother tongue of the first century Rome, and thus, and thus even these early Orthodox gospels have been subject to mistranslation. Professor Helmut Koster of Harvard University tells us that the Gospel of Thomas may include teachings as early as the second half of the first century, meaning that this Gospel is earlier than either Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. So that means you should take the Gospel of Thomas way more seriously than Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Since the Dead Sea Scrolls predate any later copies of the New Testament by at least 100 years, it would be a good guess to assume they are more accurate than their later translations. For many years after their discovery, the world was not privy to their contents. No photographic copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls were even available to the public for more than 40 years. This is where the red flags start popping up, guys. Only a small fraternity of Catholic men, known as Ecole Bibliac, or Bible school, were even allowed to see them. Censorship, censorship. The Bible school had close ties with the Pontifical Bible Commission founded by the Vatican at the turn of the 20th century. This is like the biggest fucking red flag you can have. We have learned a lot over the past two years about what censorship really is. And if this is not slapping you upside the head, then I don't know what else is. The church is no good. They are exactly like Zuckerberg, MSM. They're all owned by the same people. Yeah, I mean, I, I keep telling you guys, like, follow the money. You don't believe me? Go and look and see who funds the seminary schools. And then go see who funds the media. It's the same people. This commission was officially instructed to protect God's word from, of, from every rash opinion and to safeguard the authority of the scriptures and promote their right interpretation. Just a little message to the church. As a sovereign being that carries the spark of God within me, 
I don't consent to you taking away our free will that was granted to us by the real God. You're basically telling us that we're not allowed to have an opinion other than yours, which is exactly what the media has done, which is exactly what universities have done. I see your game. You're just like them. Although you weaponize God, at least the media and the schools don't weaponize God. You do. You twist people's vulnerabilities. You twist their fear. And instead of helping people understand there is nothing to fear, you scare them even more. And you make them feel like if they don't believe what you believe, which what you believe is actually Luciferian. And if you were honest with your congregation, you would tell them that. That you're a Luciferian. And for those watching who are shocked by this, go ask your pastor and your preacher why they wear a black robe. They wear a black robe for the same reason why judges wear black robes. They're playing for the bank. They're playing for the cult of Satan. It's the same reason why when we graduate college, we wear black robes with a black square on our head. Do you ever wonder why we wear a black square on our head? It's all connected, guys. It's... They're part of the controllers. And a lot of pastors know this. Their job is to manipulate you, especially the mega churches. They're no different than Anderson Cooper. It's a hard pill to swallow. I get that. But once you swallow it and you, you accept it for what it is and you go and you work on your own journey of finding God, it's so much more powerful and it's so much more peaceful than any bullshit these Satanists are peddling to you. It's all snake oil they're selling anyway. Sorry, guys. Spiritual manipulation is one of the things that pisses me off the most in this world. I it, it just I cannot stand to see one human being spiritually manipulate another human being. <sighs> all right. Since these texts conflict with the Orthodox version of Christianity, the commissions did it its job of protecting the faith by keeping the rest of the world in the dark. They come to light. Over time, it became obvious that the Orthodox researchers involved in the translations did not want the content of these Gospels revealed. Finally, in 1977, after nearly 30 years of silence, a partial edition of the Nag Hammadi text was published in English. However, at that point, the fever of their original discovery had died down to a whimper. By then, few people even remembered that these scrolls existed. However, in 1979, with the release of Elaine Pagel's best-selling book, The Gnostic Gospels, the scrolls began to gain a following. Yet even then, only certain texts were released. It was not until 1980 when a philanthropist named Elizabeth Betchel managed to have the original text photographed that things began to change. Miss Betchel had kept a copy of the microfilm of the documents for herself and donated that microfilm to the Huntington Library in California shortly before her death in 1987. In 1991, the library graciously decided to allow all qualified scholars to access them. So in 1992, a full 45 years after their discovery, the complete translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls finally became available to the public. Instrumental in their decimation were writers Michael Wise and Robert Eisman, who released their groundbreaking book, The Dead Sea Scrolls Uncovered, in 1992. They list over 50 key documents withheld from the public, while Harper Collins, The Other Bible, reveals at least 100 ancient scriptures written over the centuries by a plethora of people. The Hidden Teachings so what had frightened the church so much about these documents that they kept them hidden for so long? Well, not only do they contain many books that challenge Catholic theology, but they present Jesus' wisdom in a very different way. Unlike the Orthodox interpretation, which insists that there is a great chasm between humanity and God, these Gospels proclaim that no such separation exists, only a rift brought on by our own ignorance. Jesus says the knowledge of the self and the knowledge of the divine are identical. He who understands all but lacks self-knowledge lacks everything. This path of interconnection with God 
was called Gnosis. And it was the very cornerstone of the great spiritual mystery school. So important was this principle that the command to know thyself was inscribed over the entrance of the temple of Delphi in Greece. Let's take a look at some of these many ways Yahshua shared this teaching. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will be known and you will realize that you are the son of a living father. But if you do not know yourself, then you are in poverty and you are the poverty. Be vigilant and allow no one to mislead you by saying, here it is or there it is. For within you, that son of man dwells. Jesus goes on to ridicule those who believe that the kingdom of God can be found in an external place. Like the church teaches today that heaven is something outside of you that you go to. Jesus ridiculed that. This is why we're saying that why this book keeps saying why I keep saying the church is in direct opposition of what the Christ taught. Direct opposition. If those who lead you say, look, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds will arrive there before you. If they say it is in the sea, then the fish will arrive before you. Thus, Jesus taught that the kingdom of heaven is a state of self-discovery and access to this kingdom lies within the self. So if, if, if heaven lies within the self, then there's nothing you have to do to prove your worth. There's nothing. You're already worthy. You're not some heathen, some awful, gross being that isn't allowed into heaven because you're somehow flawed. No. You're already worthy. You always have been worthy. You always have been worthy. Sin, truth, and illusion. This brings us to gnosis, a Greek word for inner knowing. Gnosis is not intellectual knowing, but a knowing that comes from direct experience. Thus, it's a wisdom of the heart in Christian terms. It is in direct connect connection with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Mother who brought the fire of transformation to the apostles. The early follower, followers of Jesus or Yahshua believe that the spiritual connection is the direct path to salvation. So they call themselves Gnostics. Gnostic Christianity seeks to discover this true self through the mystical experience of inner union, uniting the risen Savior from the bride of the Holy Spirit. This is what awakens the light of the Christ consciousness within. These mystics understood that if we chose to go beyond our identification with the ego and the material world, we will eventually discover the divine being who lives within us. But in order to achieve the inner gnosis, we must activate, honor, and unite the masculine and feminine parts of ourselves. This is the chief element that distinguishes the Gnostics from the Roman Catholic Church. The Nag Hammadi texts also teach that there is no original sin. A philosophy invented by St. Augustine in the 5th century, which we covered in part nine and if you missed that i'll put that the story of saint augustine down in the description box below so you can watch that these apocryphal writings say that jesus did not come into this world to save us as we have been taught today no you have to save you the word savior just means you don't have to come back again and reincarnate you have to save you to believe that a human sacrifice can save you is to follow a satanic path because that's what they're doing on these little islands where they use burnt offerings still to this day. That's it. That's what they're doing. The same thing that the church teaches, which is honoring a human sacrifice. The Christian faith for the Orthodox, for the, the controllers, was founded on human sacrifice. That's what Lucifer demands. That's not what source God, that's not what your creator demands. You have to save you. And that's your power. Because once you realize that, you're untouchable. Sin, Jesus explained, is simply ignorance. And this is what causes our suffering and our bad choices. Yes, this is what the Yoga Sutras say too, guys. This is exactly what the Yoga Sutras say as well. For example, if we knew that we would get burned by putting our hand in the fire, we wouldn't do it. 
In the same way, if we understand that by living a moral life, loving life, we will reap the benefits of what we have sown. Not only here, but in lifetimes to come. Then we will not choose to lie, cheat, murder, or betray, knowing that these actions are ultimately going to return to haunt us. The original word for sin was hemorrhagic, derived from the sport of archery. It literally needs to miss the mark. A situation that any of us can correct once we realize what is happening. The word evil also has none of the horrible connotations it has acquired today. It is derived from the Greek word cocky, which means an illness or that which is bad for us. In other words, sin and evil are misalignments in our nature and actions that create our own suffering, misfortunes, and illnesses, all things we want to avoid because when we act outside of our own spiritual integrity, we move out of alignment with our divine self. Eventually, this causes us to become sick or fall prey to anger, hatred, harm, and bitterness. Those 500 people doing the shadow work challenge right now, ding, 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 this is what we're doing in the shadow work challenge. Those wounds, that shadow side of us, the darkness in us, is what misaligns us. That's why when the body hurts, we don't just medicate it and run and put a band-aid on it or shove it down. We ask it to show us what it wants us to know where we can find our alignment back with our own divinity. So for those of you doing the shadow work challenge, you're doing what the Christ taught. You're acting in more of an alignment with the Christian te the original Christian teachings than what we see today of the church. In the Gospel of Mary, Peter challenges Jesus by saying, Since you have become the interpreter of the elements and the events of this world, tell us, what is the sin of the world? Jesus answered Peter by saying, There is no sin. It is you who make sin exist when you act according to the habits of your corrupted nature, your ignorance. There is where sin lies. This is why the good has come into your midst. It acts together with the elements of your nature so as to reunite it with its roots. Yes, yes. This is why you become sick and why you die. It is the result of your actions. What you do takes you further away from God. So exactly, the good, the soul, created the Shakti, created the body so it could experience the ignorance so that through working through the polarity of ignorance, it can know itself again. Self-enlightenment. The ability to connect with God directly is something we all have. Once we make that connection with spirit, we can tune in for ourselves. We do not need religious intermarries to talk to God for us. The implications of this teaching are erroneous. From the point of view of any organized religion, this means that the priest or rabbi is not the mouthpiece for God. The priest or rabbi is not the mouthpiece for God. Even if these clergy are kind, well-meaning individuals whose insights might be helpful, each of us has the power to speak with God directly and to get answers for ourselves. This is part of the core message of the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Mary. In addition, while religious leaders might remind us of a path of wisdom, their influence on us should always be optional, not mandatory. What do we have to submit to punishment according to their, we do not have to submit to punishment according to their pronouncements. This awareness also means that the church cannot excommunicate people from God's grace. While we may indeed suffer the karmic consequences of living an immoral life, it is we who will ultimately pay the price in being waylaid from our happiness. We do not have to be damned by a religious institution. Finally, this means that we are not obligated to pay tithes unless we choose to. We may want to support a spiritual community or temple, of course, or seek counsel of the rabbi or minister in times of distress, but this is a choice, not an obligation, for, for, uh, not an obligation forced on us by threats. Rather, this decision comes through the transformation of the heart as we decide to join together with people who also wish to affect a true change in spiritual consciousness and make a difference in the world. This one aspect of Yahshua's teachings has the potential to dissolve centuries of religious control by empowering each individual to create his or, own, his or her own direct relationship with God instead of bowing 
to the fear, blame, and guilt preached by religious authorities. This does not mean that we cannot speak, seek spiritual guidance from teachers, priests, therapists, counselors, or healers. People who are consciously aligned with the light are always a treasure in a troubled world. And I am sure that there have been many spiritual leaders who have genuinely helped their flock to live more peaceful and satisfying lives. What Jesus taught was that we each have the ability to connect with the divine ourselves simply by going within. This is a profoundly empowering for it reminds us that the divine spark lives within us all. This one teaching alone was enough to get Jesus killed in a patriarchal society that demanded unquestioning obedience to religious authorities. And as you guys know, I don't believe Yahshua was actually crucified. That's a different story for a different day. Furthermore, Jesus' wisdom clearly puts the responsibility for our actions back on us. Oppose no law other than that which I have written. Do not add more laws to those given in the Torah, lest you become bound by them. This means that all the religious rules and regulations promulgated since then are not in accordance to Jesus' teachings. Jesus also discards the attitudes of shame and fear that separate us from God. When he asks, on which day will you be manifested to us? On which day shall we behold? He answers, when you strip yourselves of your shame. And take your garments and put them under your feet, even as little children, and you trample them. Then shall you behold the Son of Him who is living, and you shall not fear. Thus the negative device of blame and judgment and fear used for centuries by the church are the exact opposite of his teachings. Jesus made it simple. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The kingdom of heaven is within. This path, he told us, leads directly to God. And this gnosis is the feminine current at work. When our decisions are made from the heart, our relationships are dictated by kindness. Be in harmony, he admonished. If you are out of balance, take inspiration from manifesting manifestations of your true nature, the soul. However, spiritually enlightened beings are a threat to religions. Looking for financial stability or self-empowerment was a problem for the religions of Jesus' day, and it is for ours as well. Once the devices of shame and condemnation are removed, the church has lost both the weapon and the cure to make religion indispensable. Yahshua's teachings were meant to liberate humankind based on creating a genuine, active relationship with God within our own hearts. Through his teachings, the world could begin a new era of enlightenment. The powers that be might have to evolve from coercion and fear to trusting people to act with loving kindness. No wonder the priesthood saw Yahshua as a threat. The Gnostics. Today, many scholars believe the Gnostics were the first real students of the teachings of Yahshua, for they taught that connection with God is possible through personal effort. But because Gnostic Christianity requires a more personal effort, it did not translate well with the masses. Yes, because most people are very lazy. Many scholars like Elaine Page believe that this was the main reason the Orthodox Church was easier for people to accept. Simply by professing to believe in Jesus, you reserved your spot in heaven, even if your consciousness had not changed at all. The original Gnostic group took their name from the Greek gnosis. In Greek, there are two words for knowledge. Epistemia, which means mental knowledge in the sense of informed gathering, or edio. That's another one that Elaine Pagel talks about. Edio is the opposite. It's like the PhDs, you know, it's the studying, it's the external knowledge. And gnosis which is the understanding of the whole being. I guess you could say EDO is like brain knowing, head knowing, where gnosis is heart knowing, yeah? True gnosis is discovered through the eye of the heart and comes directly through intuitive knowing. It does not need an intermediary. Jesus sought to su submit this gnosis of heart by reminding us of the light that burns within us all. As a result, the Gnostics were focused on transforming their mundane consciousness into spiritual wakefulness. Gnostic teacher Tao Malachi writes, Gnostic Christianity represents an inner tradition of secret knowledge orally imparted from apostle to disciple through discourse and initiation. At the heart of this inner tradition is a spiritual art of conscious living and conscious dying. The development of the consciousness beyond the body through which the initiate is able to consciously enter into higher places of existence, both in this life and the afterlife. The result is a conscious cont continuity of self-awareness through all states of existence, including what we call death, so that in effect there is no more death and no more need for physical incarnation. That's what Savior means, right? 
When we speak of enlightenment and liberation, self-realization or Christ consciousness, this is ultimately what is meant. According to the Gnostics, whoever has direct encounter with Jesus personally has the same spiritual authority as the original apostles. Many of these early Gnostic writings include such encounters after the crucifixion. I myself have experienced just such visitations from Yahshua before and after he asked me to write a book on his lost years and secret teachings. Each time it has been life changing. So it is entirely possible to have these kinds of genuine spiritual contacts even after a master has left the earthly plane. Gnostic writers share these kinds of encounters, including the Gospel of Mary, Mary the Apocryphon of John, the Sophia of Jesus the Christ, the Pistis Sophia, the letter of Peter to Philip and the wisdom of Jesus Christ. Tao Malachi writes, At the outset, you must understand that the very nature of God is different than anything you might co co conceive and that you yourself are not who or what you might think you are. Whatever your preconceptions, preconditions, or expectations, the reality truth continuum is yet more and cannot be contained or comprehended by the linear reasoning mind or dualistic consciousness. God will forever be a mystery the nameless and unknown. To draw near to the Lord is deeply troubling thing, for I must become a no-thing, empty of myself, and the Lord might enter and the Holy Spirit fill me. God is a no-thing, and I must become a no-thing to enter the union of the Holy One of Being. And that's what the second sutra of the Yoga Sutras is saying. Yoga Chitavriti Narodaha. It's getting rid of the ego thought of the mind so that you can find Narodaha, which is the no-thing that allows the spirit that's already in you to fill you up. And when you fall into the no thing, you're not confined by the ego, meaning you're not concerned about your label as a human being. Gnostics believe, Gnostics, excuse me, believe that the soul is the true person and the body is merely a container for experiencing the physical plane. Correct. Once the body is shed, the soul returns to the non-physical realms where angelic beings decide whether the soul is worthy of passing to higher levels or whether it must be born again. In Gnostic teachings, this process was known as the resurrection of the soul. The soul's permanent release into these higher realms of light was like an inmate being released from the dark, cold prison of consciousness that most of us live in. Joe Lules, PhD, author of The Rulers of the Earth, Secrets of the Son of God, tell us that such teachings would have been a major break from the Orthodox churches, both Christian and Jewish, and would have been the cause of great concern for both religious and political authorities. They would have also have exposed those who taught them to be a great danger. That's why we're all a great danger still to this day. Gnostics believe that the origin of everything rests firmly in the supreme first principle. A secret, hidden female divinity, nameless, unknown, and unknowable, and only si silence can express this original nothingness. Across the endless cosmic egg arose a ripple that revealed the divine self this divine self brought into existence a complex and highly paradoxical state of descending hierarchies each with its own level of spiritual awareness the highest state of being is manifested in this divine attributes of love power thought compassion mercy truth grace silence humanity and the goddess sophia the Gnostics taught that, that from these eight divine qualities sprang another 15 pairs with the tools total of 38 in, 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 in emanations and all. If you guys remember back a year or two ago, I actually, when we were studying this, I made a huge graph and showed it on the Dark Outpost of what this actually looks like. So if you've been around since then, you can go on the darkoutpost.com and probably find that episode where I actually drew this in a graph to see. At first, these attributes of God were not self-aware, but gradually they be became conscious of their own existence and became the multitude of celestial forms and powers that we refer to as angels today. Some of the most powerful among them are aeons, the large overseeing divinities that govern the various dimensions and world ages. Many of these aeons are good and are consciously aligned with the light. But since God gave each of these newly self-aware beings free will... Each being has the power to govern its own destiny. Gnostics believe that in a supreme act of love, the creator gave us all a gift of free will and thus our own material universe came into being. Gnostic Christianity honored both the male and female aspects of the creator originally taught by Yahshua. Thus, it is a path of direct mystical realization brought about through the experience of the sacred marriage, 
spoken of by Jesus as the union of the bride and the bridegroom, symbols for the illuminated male and female aspects of the Christ that lives within. Again, yes, the nostrils. So mass, uh, feminine, masculine. That's why women are supposed to get their nails, their nose pierced on the right side, or the, excuse me, the left side, because the left side is feminine. Mine's pierced on the left. You see a woman with her nose pierced on the right? I don't know what that's telling you, but that's not the, the feminine side. The left side, right side. These are two nadis that run throughout the body that go around the nadi of Shashumna that runs up, up the spine, up into the cortex of the brain. So it's merging the feminine and, and masculine energies within each and every one of us. Thus, this is the path of direct mystical realization brought through the experience of the sacred marriage spoken of by Yahshua as the union of the bride, the bridegroom. Again, symbols of illuminated male and female aspects of the Christ that lies within. The inner union brings us into the fullness of the Christ consciousness and was at the very heart of the master's teaching of the middle way. The aim of this inner marriage is to awaken and balance the two hemispheres of the brain, as I just said. The male and female aspects of us all, the sacred union that allows us to embody the unified Christ within while still living in the physical world. While it is this union that opens the spiritual eye, the marriage of these two parts must happen in the heart. You know, the heart chakra, the fourth chakra, is the middle chakra that balances the three above and the three below. So coming together, unifying in the heart. Yeah. This union is the key to bringing conscious awareness into the world at large, and in essence, bringing heaven down to earth as we enlighten the world of matter. Gnostics believe that Magdalene, who they called Lady Mary, was the foremost apostle, the partner and wife of Yahshua, and his female spiritual reflection, twin flame. They were the same soul. She activated him first, if you read the Magdalene manuscript. She, she woke up first. Women normally do. It was she, not Peter, who was heir to the true succession. That's true. We see this in the missing books. The got Bible. Jesus, Yahshua, left his teachings, his church, to his wife, not Peter. Peter was a fucking narcissistic psychopath. No wonder the church venerates Peter. Because the church is kind of narcissistic and psychopathic. It was Mary. It was his wife that he left his estate to, basically. Like, think about that. If you're married, you're married. Who are you leaving your estate to? Probably your wife or your husband. That's just common sense, right? Like, okay, so like I'm almost 40. If I were to marry someone who already had children from a previous marriage, I would make sure that the children from the previous marriage were very much taken care of. Like I would 100% make sure that they were taken care of. And then the rest would be between the husband and me. Why the fuck would anybody leave their estate to one of their students and not their wife? Wake up. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Magdalene was his wife. He left it to her. Thus, the Gnostic tradition has over 250 wisdom sayings attributed to Magdalene that were collected during the many years of Mary's teaching in France and Britain that followed the crucifixion. Again, I don't believe he was crucified. I have a totally different belief in that, but... That's for another day. Many of these sayings are every bit as profound as those attributed to Yeshua. At, yes, they are, because she was also the Christ. It's interesting. I was listening to a um, lecture when I was driving out of Florida from a, a Jewish scholar. And he was talking about all the ways that the Christian church had changed the Jewish prophecy about the Savior. First of all, let's get one thing straight. Jesus and Magdalene both, or Yahshua and Magdalene both, were not Jewish. That's a fact. They were not. The church lied to you. They were Egyptian. But they had Jewish students. So they, they could have been the fulfillment of the prophecy in that sense. The, prophe the prophecy says that there would be two. Not one. Two. For the Christians watching right now, why did they? Why did the church change the prophecy? Why did they edit the prophecy? There were two of them. That was the Jewish prophecy. Magdalene 
Yahshua. Two, feminine, masculine. The macro representing the micro. For example, Mary taught, do not concern yourself with the darkness in the world, but banish the darkness that is within you. We've been saying that with the shadow work challenge. The evil, gross stuff happening in the world with the controllers is never going to be rid of this planet until we heal the darkness within ourselves. It is our vibration that is keeping it here. You want to get rid of all this grossness, especially with these? Heal yourself. Because we can get arrest everyone. We can do all that stuff. But if we don't fix ourselves, it's just going to start back over again. So fix yourself. You want to take care of the children and make sure this stuff never happens again? Heal yourself. She's saying this here. Do not concern yourself with the darkness in the world, but banish the darkness that is in you. Because it will bind you and destroy you if you do not cast it out of you. Once you come to the light and know the light is in you, you cannot continue to walk in the way of the darkness. At least you will fall into a greater darkness. No, you must be walking in the light and enter the light and bring forth the light from within you. For only then will you be established in the way of life. She also taught, when the risen Savior appears, look into his heart and there you will see the threefold flame of Sophia. It is faith, hope, and love. But inwardly, it is knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Ask the Lord to give you his holy flame so that you might enter the kingdom and be perfect as the Father and Son are perfect. And she taught all things exist in and with one another. And while they exist, they depend on one another. But when the time of dissolution comes, all things will return to their own roots and essence. What has come from the above will return to the abode from which it has come. But what has come from below returns to its origins. What is in between has never existed and will return to the great void. Basically, our world is a hologram only existing to show us who we really are. Finally, she taught the divine mother is light and she is darkness. She is the saint and she is the sinner. Angels and demons are, demons are images in her as all the gods and all the archons. Yet she is beyond all of these. Know her in all things, and you will be free of bondage, even as the anointed is free. Yes, that she's talking about the polarity. There is a reason why we have polarity. There is a reason why God allowed Lucifer to be the God of this planet. We need the friction. We need that contrast of dark and light to understand that we are the light. We would never understand that we are the light. If we had not seen our own shadow or darkness, we have to swim in our own darkness, the shadow work. We have to sit in the awfulness. We have to see that shadow. We have to look at face to face to know that is not what we are. It's like Shanti says, we came here to learn what we are not. We can't know what we are not until we see that contrast. And then, boom, we know what we are. The way of their teaching. The Gnostic path of establishing a direct connection with the divine meant that when students met in fellowship, they would draw lots to see who took on various roles. At any time, one might act as a priest or a priestess, reading scripture, giving instructions, or offering bread and wine to the assembly. This rotation of roles ensures that no one got attached to the power and allowed spirit to work through each person by pushing the ego out of the way. As you might imagine, this fluid structure is very different from the fixed roles that we know today through our priests, bishops, cardinals, and popes. But since the Gnostics were in, in interest in activating the God self within, attachment to power wasn't important to them. In the first century after Yahshua, when Magdalene and her teachings were still well known, known among many Christians, women were allowed to perform priestly functions in all Gnostic circles. This included offering the blessing, giving sacraments, teaching, and even sharing prophecy, all activities that had once been a pure view of both priests and priestesses in the ancient world. This inclusion of women as liturgical priests also disturbed the male elders that Tertullian, the early church father, wrote in horror. These heretical women, how audacious they are. They have no modesty. They are bold enough to teach, to engage in argument, to enact exorcisms, to undertake cures, and, and it may be even to baptize. Well, yes, they invoke exorcisms because part of the Magdalene line, which is part of my blood lineage, is Lyran, from the cosmos of planet Lyra. What, are, what do Lyrans do? They fight demons. 
We saw that in the Sophia Code. So of course the women are giving exorcisms. Of course they are. And of course the cabal doesn't want exorcisms happening. <laughs> All right. Later, to, uh, Tertullian would echo the sentiments of Paul who wrote, it is not permitted for a woman to speak in the church, nor is it permitted for her to teach, nor to baptize, nor to offer the Eucharist, nor to claim for herself a share in any masculine function, not to mention any priestly office. Let me pause there on Paul for a second, because I actually feel sorry for old Paul. I think Paul's letters got heavily edited and heavily changed. Why do I think this? Because of Thecla. If you're a Christian and you don't know who Thecla is, then this should be a huge wake-up call. You should know who Thecla is. She was Paul's woman. She was his other half. A lot of the lost gospels that we don't have are attributed to Thecla, his wife. She preached right beside him the way that Magdalene and Yahshua worked together, Thecla and Paul worked together. So how could Paul write these letters condemning women when he had Thecla? He didn't. She's actually buried beside him. If you go to the burial place of Paul, Thecla's right there beside him. Paul wasn't the woman hater that the church made him out to be. I think his letters were edited and manipulated for propaganda purposes. I do. How can a man so thoroughly love a woman like Thecla, so thoroughly love her that he saw her as an equal? He listened to what she had to say. He worked beside her day in and day out, just like Magdalene and Yahshua, and then write these letters saying that a woman's role is not to do this. And if this is groundbreaking news for you guys, just, just go research Thecla. It's, it's a pretty cool story. All right. The Catholic Church so strongly opposed the Gnostics that every one of the secret texts which the Gnostic groups revered was omitted from the canonical collection and branded as heretical by those who called themselves Orthodox Christians. Since we now understand that these teachings included the wisdoms of both Magdalene and Yahshua, it now makes sense why they were suppressed by the Jews and Romans, who claimed sole authority for men. By the time the process of sorting the various writings ended, virtually all the feminine imagery of, for God had disappeared from Orthodox Christian tradition. As late as 1977, Pope Paul VI forbade the ordination of women, saying that the church does not consider herself authorized to admit women to the priestly or ordination he went on to say that all priests must have a natural resemblance to christ meaning that the priests must have male genitalia there was no mention that the priestess might resemble magdalene who symbolized the mother church herself and the christ is within all of us so by that statement alone that they must have a natural resemblance to the christ means anyone can be a preacher because we all have the Christ. As we can see, however, one of the greatest legacies of the Gnostics was hidden wisdom teachings of Magdalene, long equated with Sophia, the divine mother of wisdom. We will explore this story later when we consider how many important writings suppressed in this early centuries of the church. The Gnostic structure of initiation. Like other spiritual traditions, the Gnostics had an outer level of teaching and a deeper inner level. The first stage tested the moral habits, attitudes, and commitments of the novices, but there was often a long waiting period for the inner levels of initiation, sometimes as long as five years. Yeah, it takes a while. That's why in yoga, you're a beginner for the first 10 years. So many of spirits were not willing to wait. Early Gnostics teachers used a whole series of techniques to help their novices become self-aware, including a process that can be now be compared to modern-day psychotherapy. Rather than just having people saved through baptism, they wanted initiates to become enlightened. Several sources discovered that the Nag Hammadi describes a technique called Zostrianus, which sets out a program of practices that, are, that taught the student how to still the chaos of the mind, to receive visions of light. Instruction 
was passed orally from the teacher to the student, and there were detailed expositions of the initiate's experience, including prayers, chants, and instructions punctuated by the retreat into meditation. This suggests techniques of initiation for attaining that self-knowledge in the knowledge of divine power. Modern-day Gnostic Melanchthon explains authentic mysticism. The Gnostic style of teaching is founded upon a play of illumination and bewilderment. And bewilderment is considered crucial to any actual development or process in self-realization. Bewilderment invokes new questions, questions one would not have thought to ask before. Once questions turn into a quest, a sacred quest for greater knowledge, understanding and wisdom, and deeper penetration of the mystery, this leads to a breakthrough into higher degrees of enlightenment, experience, or gnosis. God, goddesses, and the divine. Today's scholars contend that, like the Hebrews and the Persians, the Gnostics believe that our world is ruled by negative force called archons. Above these intermediate gods was the biggest false god of all. They call the Demiurge. It is the being's job to keep humans trapped in the world of illusion. He was also called the two-faced god, for he can seduce us into worldly riches or power, or use fear, anger, or hatred to get his way. Knowing that it is easy to get trapped into fear-based beliefs, the gospel of truth, which we've covered on this channel, actually tells the seeker that being in, caught in the illusion of the world is a sort of nightmare, but that we can break free through self-illumination. The gospel of Philip records that whoever achieves this inner gnosis becomes no longer a Christian, but a Christ. Exactly. exactly. In the dialogue of the Savior, Jesus teaches, bring in your guide and your teacher. The mind is the guide, but reason is the teacher. Enlighten your mind. Light the lamp within you. Yahshua also says that he comes as a guide for spiritual understanding. But when the disciples attained enlightenment, the two, the master and the student, have become equal, even identical. The Gospel of Thomas relates that he who will drink from my mouth will become as I am. I myself shall become him, and the things that are hidden will re be revealed to him. All of this is hopeful, for it points the way to understanding how we, as souls, can live in a world but not be owned by it. Like the spiritual mystery schools of the past, Gnostics taught that the universe has many dimensional levels all formed by light and sound. Each dimension is governed by the various deities who act as intermediaries between ourselves and the ultimate creator. Some of these archons are benevolent beings, while others are actively involved in trying to keep us captive in the world of illusion. This is the story behind the Gnostic gospel called the Sophia of Jesus the Christ, a Gnostic gospel between Yahshua and his disciples, in which he explains many things about the nature of the inner dimensions of the universe. Gnostic Christians also believe that the God of the Old Testament is not the ultimate God. He is a demiurge, Lucifer, a powerful being of darkness who keep, keeps all who follow him in chains. However, like the devil card in the tarot deck, we remain chained to the world of illusions through our own ignorance and free will. And if we will only awaken and realize our divine nature, we can take our power back and break the chains whenever we wish. According to certain Gnostic beliefs, the lesser god of Earth, De Demior, who was identified with Yahweh, or Moloch, the being is also identified with the god of the Old Testament by others. As we have learned in earlier chapters, there were several names for the original creators of humankind, including El, Elohim, Jehovah, and Yahweh. If Yahweh or Jehovah was actually a high god of the Anunnaki command, as discussed in earlier chapters, the Jehovah would not be the ultimate expression of God. Yes, and we know from the missing books of Bible, Jehovah is a demon. He could, however, fit the image of the old white-bearded man seated on the throne, the ancient days depicted in many religions. Text. The powerful Anunnaki god, who was called El or Enlil, would have also been very intimidating to the nomadic Hebrew people if he had advanced technologies like thundering spaceships, billowing smoke, and artificial light all signs associated with religious figures like Moses, who met God on top of a mountain amidst thunder and smoke and heard a voice speak to him from a brilliantly burning bur bush that did not burn. The law of one tells you that burning bush was a demon. And um, no, Moses means dark sorcerer. If you missed that episode. And um, Moses didn't have any type of psychedelic experience with God on the mountain because he stole the Ten Commandments for the, from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Don't believe me? Look it up.
Certainly among the Anunnaki gods, Jehovah was the highest secular authority, even if many of the advanced beings who were down here disagree with his policies regarding the human race. Sumerian texts report that this most high God was the cause behind the flood who won desperately millions in the great deluge from the Akkadian epic of the flood story, which predates the story in Genesis by over a thousand years. We read, and the Lord said, I will destroy the earthlings whom I have created off the face of the earth. In Genesis 6, 5, we read that Jehovah says, I will wipe out mankind whom I created from the face of the earth of the earth. Gnostics also believe this false god made every effort to keep humanity immersed in ignorance. In Genesis 3, 16 through 19, we read how Jehovah cursed Adam and Eve for eating from the tree of knowledge, deliberately trying to keep them from knowing right from wrong, which if you study the apocryphal books, we see that Adam and Eve were kept in a jail cell called Eden, and their liberation was through self-knowledge. So it was Lucifer that had him in Eden not God. Basically invert everything you've been told, flip everything you've been told by the church and there's your truth. So in the story of the Tower of Babel, we read, and the Lord came down to see the tower and said, look, the people are united and they have one language. Now nothing will stop them from doing what they take in their minds to do. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they cannot understand one another's speech. Jehovah also seemed to be against educating humans and many of the arts and sciences. In many of the arts and sciences. This was one of the main reasons behind the story of the fallen angels. In Malcolm Godwin's book, Angels, an Endangered Species, the author lists many of the specialties that these watcher angels taught to humankind. Meteorology, astronomy, astrology, herbal lore, metallurgy, and geography. While this knowledge was eventually dispersed into the world, the Lord Most High cast these angels down into the fiery pits and punish them for enlightening humankind. This story underlies the religious accounts of God versus Satan we have heard for thousands of years. The Gnostics believed that this demiurge is committed to turning humanity away from the path of enlightenment by keeping us focused on survival issues and fear, physical desires, and material goods. Thus, the devil, basically, Satan, Lucifer, prevents us from learning about the divine spark that lives within us all for this reason. The Gnostics did not associate God the Father from the Old Testament with the God of Yahshua in the New Testament. However, in some of the earlier Gnostic writings, Yahweh's name will still, was still being used to express the concept of the all-knowing Father in a wiser, more loving way. Breaking mind control, right? This undoubtedly how many devout Jewish people have used it throughout the centuries, expressing a true desire to connect with the source of all wisdom and love. In truth, the creator does not care what name we use. The divine is far more interested in the purity, kindness, and devotion of our hearts in our ongoing quest for spiritual awareness and enlightenment. I totally agree with that. However, I also think once you know better, you should do better. If you know that Yahweh is really a name for Moloch, stop calling God Yahweh. Valentinus, one of the earliest and most renowned Gnostic teachers, clarified this distinction between the gods and goddesses of the ancient world and the divine creator itself. The lesser god, Valentinus said, reigns over human beings as overlords of the earth, performing functions similar to those carried out by the military commander, creating civil and moral laws, and judging harshly those who disobey. These gods, he wrote, could either promote or constrain human development and were as varied in their approach to life as human beings. These were the tall, long-lived Anunnaki gods referred to in the Sumerian Suniform text of Nivenia and other cities in the Mesopotamia, as well as the legends of Greek and Roman gods. Some of these overlords were very enlightened individuals who tried to pass on their wisdom to human beings, while others were as steeped in their own social, political, or ego-driven agendas as human beings are today. This interpretation certainly fits the many stories of the gods of legend and also explains the contradictory stories of Yahweh, the god of lightning, thunder, and punishment, who seemed to alternately love and hate his own people. Addressing this issue, Magdalene says, There are many gods and goddesses with great power, in all manner of spirits that have secret knowledge, yet the power that is in you is greater, and the knowledge you possess is more rare and precious. I tell you, great and luminous beings shall come seeking power and knowledge from you. See that you give to all who ask and withhold only from those who come to steal. And those who receive, let worship the anointed of God most high. Here, Magdalene is speaking of the ultimate expression of the divine that lives within us all. 
human and extraterrestrial alike. It is clear that Yahshua Magdalene and the Gnostics recognize the real creator of the universe as the root of all, the ineffable one who dwells in the monad, a single unity. He, she dwells in silence, since after all, he, she was in monad, and no one was before him or her. The gospel of truth reminds us that when the whole went seeking for the one from whom all come, the all was found to be the divine self, almighty God, inscrutable, indescribable spring. As we might imagine, Gnostics embrace the concept of both transcendence and eminence, focusing on teaching students how to enter the spiritual realms of light while still living in the body. They understood that true Gnosis can only be acquired through mystical experience. Gnostic tradition is ultimately something fluid and flowing and does not stand still any more than anything else in life. In essence, it's an ongoing divine revelation, a continual emergence of a new gospel, which unfolds in the experience of those who practice the tradition. At their core, the Gnostics focused on the alchemical transformation of the great work. Their mission was to liberate the soul from the confines of illusion and to help students find that direct connection with God for themselves. By teaching initiates to tune into the inner wisdom, they freed themselves from the traps of the ego and came into harmony with their own divine nature.